Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cloud Wars Live, where we explore today's digital revolution, even through the lens of the COVID-19 crisis over the last couple months and how it has changed everything in our personal lives and our business lives. Today, we're delighted to have one of our regular digital all-star guests, Wayne Saden. Wayne appears with us monthly and he discusses Saden on digital. Wayne has been a CDO, a CIO, a CTO, and he currently advises boards and CEOs on how to weave the digital strategy in with their overall business strategy. And on top of that, Wayne has been working closely now with a lot of his clients on what does this impact of the new normal mean. Wayne, welcome back to Cloud Wars Live. It's great to have you as always. Hey, Bob, thank you for having me. It's always good to be here. And you get me thinking about stuff that I don't otherwise think about. So I appreciate it. Oh, uh, sure. Wayne, Wayne, lots going on there. Um, first, you know, you, you, you look good. I hope that, you know, everybody in your world is safe and, and doing well. Yeah, well, I live on the Gulf Coast in Texas. We have low population density. Uh, we have the fresh salt air. We have heat and humidity, which is supposed to be good for us. So... I can't complain, we're safe, we're socially distant, but we're close enough to be able to buy farm fresh groceries. So when I go to the farmer's market, the cows were down the street a week earlier. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, careful Wayne, you, you know, that sort of plug for the Gulf Coast, you're gonna, the population's gonna boom down there. We have room, <laughs> come on down. <laughs> Sounds good. So. Wayne, one of the things that, uh, you know, you had sent us some notes, some top of mind ideas for it today, and you really seem to be getting into this idea of the new normal. It's something a lot of folks are talking about, but give us your perspective on this and where you see some of these different vectors heading as everybody starts to poke their head up. I even saw this commercial today. It was for a car company and they said, all right, everybody's getting ready to shift from park into drive. We're getting ready to move and unlock the doors and go. What do you think, Wayne? Well, I think we are getting ready to move and we are unlocking the doors and we are going and it helps every now and then to figure out where we're going. <laughs> yeah. So true. Uh, when I work with my clients, we normally talk about digital transformation, of course, and people think, as you and I have discussed, that that means technology first, but it doesn't. It means what's your product, what's your culture, what's your market? What's your business going to look like? So lately I've been thinking about what is the world going to look like? And obviously I see it through a technology lens, but I started by thinking, what is the working environment going to be like when we unlock the front door, walk downstairs, and then head for work? So first thing, remember, I'm from New York. I grew up in Brooklyn and worked on Wall Street. And so I thought about what would the work day be like when you commute to work in a tube under the ground called a subway that's packed? And then when you get to your destination, you take another tube called an elevator and go up to your office. Um, I know I wouldn't want to do either of those things, even wearing a mask. And I think a lot of people agree with me. So if, you had a, if I had to predict short term at least, dense urban environments, with horizontal and vertical tube commutes, subways, elevators, are gonna fall from favor. It's a heck of a lot easier to think about taking a bus or a private car or even a bicycle and getting to your office and then being able to walk up a couple flights of stairs and get to your desk, which of course will now be much more socially distant. So, when you think about the office space, people, I think, are going to want to move away from the New Yorks, the San Francisco with BART, Paris, London, cities like that, and move into the suburbs and exurbs. And so if, if you were an investor and somebody came to you and said, I want to build a new office building in Manhattan that's 45 stories tall, and somebody else came to you and said, I'm going to go to the Frisco, Texas, outside of Dallas, where they're doing $8 billion of development already, and right there on the side of a highway with bike trails around it, I'm going to build a three-story building on five acres with lots of parking and you can walk to restaurants and shops, which would you invest in? And so when you take into account larger offices, lower buildings, I think the business of pouring concrete for roads, the business of pouring concrete for low-rise buildings and for parking lots is going to boom as we try to move away from 
the places where many of us were brought up and where culture, um, everybody believes where culture lives. Uh, it's a, uh, it is something Wayne. And you know, <clears throat> uh, anyway, folks, I just want to quickly interject here. I'm sorry. This is a bad allergy time of year for me. So I, I apologize if I hack and cough my way through this. Uh, I, I'm, I'll, try to limit that as much as possible. But Wayne, you know, one of the, the great uh, technology companies now, paradoxically, you know, Salesforce with uh, some of the remarkable things Mark Benioff has been doing is, you know, many of the great companies in lots of fields, but the tech companies have, I, I think, done a really terrific job of stepping up here and trying to contribute in a wide variety of ways to, you know, the, the crisis we've been through and adapt to what is going to go on in the future. And then you've got Salesforce, which over the past few years has made part of its brand, these 50 story office towers in major cities throughout the country. So it's, it's been interesting. I found when hearing Mark Benioff talk some about, you know, how lots of things are going to change the concern and care he's expressed with the people in his company, yet he's got these uh, vertically challenged office spaces now that, uh, that, you know, are becoming part of his company's brand. So we're going to see, I think, a lot of companies try to face up to this. And, you know, what happens here? What happens if the we work model? You know, there, there's going to be so many things we're going to have to adapt to and find the right ways to pursue uh, over the next year or two. I agree with you. And your point about the next year or two is very valid. Once we have a vaccine and once we have herd immunity, and once it's not unsafe to get in an elevator with other people, we'll go back to some extent to the old normal, or maybe that's the old new normal as tech companies move downtown and take up skyscrapers. But many of us have learned and many companies have learned that it's okay to have most of your staff work from home. I have most of the clients I've talked to and friends I've talked to have moved to the work from home environment pretty seamlessly most stuff has worked more or less. They found the rough edges and were beating them to death with hammers to clean them up. But business as usual is going on. And so a lot of executives that said, never, I'm not going to put up with it, are now realizing that it may not be so bad. Now, do I think that means that a traditional executive in a legacy industry in flyover country, like where I consult, is going to say, like Twitter did, everybody work from home forever. No, hell no. They're going to say, I want to be able to walk down the hall and see the smiling faces of my employees. Do I think they're right? Hell no. Do I think they still run companies? Yes. And so until that group retires or moves on, we're going to see a return to the office. And so, you know, Eric Schmidt was on Face the Nation on Sunday talking about the same thing. And Eric Schmidt obviously is a tech, uh, tech giant, and he believes there's going to be more investment in offices because they have to be bigger. Yeah. So I completely agree that we're going to reconfigure our environments. And by the way, have you thought about as retail declines, what we might do with malls? Imagine a two-story construct with huge amounts of parking around it and lots of open space that had used to have retail stores in it and now has food courts, maybe a gym, and maybe even a movie theater, which will probably fill with half the seats. Imagine putting your office in a defunct mall. So creativity and cleverness is going to be at a premium for the next few years. But we ought to be thinking about how we can repurpose facilities and take advantage of them. So one point I want to make when it comes to work from home, um, I'm lucky enough that I have space. I live in Texas. We have space in Texas. But lots of people are discovering that work from home, when you have multiple breadwinners, may require reconfiguring your home. So the money we're going to save on commuting, potentially, and wearing suits to the office, because now you see people in t-shirts with the cat on their lap, um, I think we're going to be building bigger homes, just slightly big enough to hold our home office comfortably and away from the dog and the kids. Also, I saw this on the internet. I don't know how to give credit to. Imagine you have an apartment, a condo co-op apartment, and you have two addresses. So here's my social address where I live, and maybe there's another door. 
That's my office address. And maybe there's a WeWork-ish thing in that building. I, I know a number of high-end condos and apartments and co-ops that have office space you can rent, kind of the co-working environment. So imagine if you could maintain that, I work here, I live here, and still do it in one space with two, let me say, facades. So I think we're going to see a lot of that as well as work from home becomes home is work. It's not work from home. It's my office happens to be down the hall from my bed and not at the end of a subway ride. Yeah. <clears throat> Wayne, I like you. You've talked about that instead of WFH. What about WFA? Work from yeah. anywhere, right? Well, right now we have to be home because you can't go anywhere else. So we call it that. But when you think about the technology, and again, when you think about the technology that's in our hands today, when you think about having a smartphone with a pen and camera and 5G, and this has a terabyte of storage and I think 16 gig of RAM, when you think about, I've got uh, LED lights here that are about that big. My high definition video camera is about that big. In my briefcase, because I'm a consultant, in my briefcase, I travel with enough gear to have this meeting everywhere. So oftentimes when you and I have talked, when I wasn't stuck at home, I was in a Starbucks or an airport or a client's lobby. And so I think that's going to become more and more common. And I think socially, it's the big change. It used to be when I was talking to you, I put on a business shirt. I made sure my background was business you know, usually a blackboard or whiteboard with something written on it to look cool. Now you see people with kids running in and out with cats, with by the Supreme Court, there was the, the uh, bathroom noise, uh, the uh, Anthony Fauci's testimony, there was somebody, I think his dog in the background. So we're changing the, no the social norms and it doesn't mean we have to pretend as much as we did. It's okay to have a cluttered background. It's okay to have my liquor cabinet behind me. It's okay to be in a t-shirt. I dressed up for this, but it's okay to be more human. And I think that's going to make a big change so that work from anywhere might very well be working from your car pulled over safely, working from the beach, working from wherever you happen to be. And I think that's going to be a terrific change if we resist the blurring of our work and our life if you're on call 24 by seven all the time, if you're always expected to be able to jump on a video, that'll be a negative, but I hope we're all smart enough over time to resist that. Yeah, yeah, Wayne, you know, uh, as you were talking about space inside homes and, you know, being able to reconfigure that, you know, and get that uh, office space over here and the living space over here. I also thought it was interesting what you said, if you extend this idea of more space out to factories and supply chains. Now, um, <clears throat> at some point, right, there's, there's a cost to this. And if everybody's moving things out and more space like that, are things going to become some things going to become more expensive? Is the cost of manufacturing going to rise as the need for bigger factories opens up? And, you know, there, there's a lot of dynamics that it sounds like an ideal solution, but, you know, there, there's repercussions to all these decisions we make, right? Oh, yeah, there are trade-offs. Right now, what have we spent? Uh, I think we're up to $3 trillion with another $3 trillion on the table in the U.S. alone. So let's say this is a 12 to $14 trillion event around the world. How much is it worth to spend to make the next one? And there will be a next one whenever it happens, different from this one. So I started my career in manufacturing and I've spent some time in logistics, supply chain and transportation. So I've been down on the factory floor engineering these assembly lines, um, some low volume, some high volume, some multinational. And so I have some feel for this. So when you talk about socially distancing people, there are two ways you can do it. You can spread out the line. If the line was 150 feet long, now it's 250 feet. And with clever design, you can wrap it around, you can build serpentine, you can use height instead of just uh, width. So you can do some clever things to keep people more apart. Uh, and again, I'll say what I said about office buildings. I think we're going to build more gigafactories, more, what does uh, Musk call it, the alien robot factory. We'll build very large factories where people can get to them. And again, I will say as a former New Yorker who's lived in some very regulated places and now lives in Texas, 
there is an advantage to living in a state with a more uh, business-friendly regulatory climate. We can get buildings built faster around here than we could in New York and Boston and California. So imagine a factory that's built bigger. And yes, that will have a cost to it, but you know what's gonna happen. The other thing we can do to do socially distancing is have every other worker replaced by automation. Mm -hmm. Does anybody doubt that's happening? Of course not. I think what we're seeing like other areas is that the pandemic and the subsequent reaction is moving our technology and our acceptance of technology forward by many years in a few months. So more robotic lines, um, more technology, more vision systems, more actuators, internet of things. I think if we built a new factory in the US where we know labor is expensive versus what we would build in say a low cost labor arbitrage country, we would naturally build more automation. But as you saw, when Elon Musk with Tesla decided to automate the heck out of his factory, what happened? He had to pull back for a while. He had to pull back until he changed the design of the car. If you look at how the Model S and the Model 3 are built versus the Model Y, they change the castings so they can be better roboticized. Mm -hmm. So I think we're gonna see products re-engineered. I think we're gonna see processes re-engineered and they're gonna dovetail. But the other thing we have to ask ourselves is, what's it worth not to be without a mask? What's it worth to be with, not to be without semiconductors or without medicine. And so I know what I would feel, charge me a little extra, but tell me I can get it by driving down the street. My comment about the cows, I go to a farmer's market to shop. I've got eggs, I've got meat because they're down the street. Uh, again, Texas in the summer, everything that grows is grown here, I think. Yeah. So I'm not too worried about something that I would have been worried about in midtown Manhattan or maybe in uh, North Dakota, where perhaps the growing season is different. Um, have, being close to my supply chain does have benefits. You know, there's a, a company in North Texas, and I don't remember the name, they're in the mask business, the biggest manufacturer of masks in the United States of a certain type, I believe. And the factory was not running three shifts. And they went to the owner and said, how come you're not running three shifts? We need all the masks we can get. And his answer was very telling. He said, the last time we had a pandemic with SARS or MERS or something, I ramped up like crazy. I put in machinery. I hired three shifts. And before I finished selling the second lot, mm -hmm. the pandemic was over. And every hospital went back to saving three cents a mask. And I lost money on the machines and had to lay everybody off. And I'm not doing it again. I cannot sink the company when everybody is only looking for that three cents a mask difference. And by the way, the happy ending was the National Guard came and staffed his factory, apparently. So he did not have to hire people that he would then have to fire, and we got more masks out. But we've got to recognize that there's risk in our supply chain. And as a CIO and consultant to CIOs, I worry about risk. I've got the risk of moving fast and maybe not being as secure, or I have the risk of being very secure and moving more slowly and maybe missing an opportunity. So what I want to know is that is my just-in-time supply chain got a little buffer stock at various points? Mm -hmm. Is there a warehouse? Is there something always on the water? Is there a factory close by that I can spin up? Uh, the other thing rel relevant to this is look at the toilet paper situation. Why were we out of toilet paper? The reason is that, and I'm, I came out of the paper industry, by the way, high volume, low margin paper is made on a very specialized line. The machine that makes the toilet paper and rolls this big out of that horrible, very cheap recycled substance is not switching to Charmin in a family role. Remember early, early days of the pandemic, you could go to Staples or Home Depot and buy toilet paper. You'd buy a case of giant rolls. Those machines are very efficient, but they're not very flexible. So again, I think that if I was a paper company, I would invest differently and I would invest in more flexibility in my machinery down the road. So that if it came to pass that I had a pivot, I could pivot from restaurant slash industrial slash office to consumer and back again. Mm -hmm. Never had to do it, so why would we? But having been schooled in this, I think we're gonna build a lot more flexibility into our supply chain.
So Wayne, that ties in with those ideas of, you know, the, the in our modern world, the agility, nimbleness, flexibility that you've been describing. So efficiency will play a part in there, but it's almost like uh, the X, Y axis. You know, how do you find the right spot and the right combination of those factors? Absolutely. It's always a trade-off we make. We can run exactly one product very, very efficiently, or we can build a machine around and a production process around being able to pivot. But, you know, the beauty of what we've got with technology now is if you look back at how machines were built 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and don't kid yourself, in the paper industry, a 50-year-old machine would be considered a new machine. <laughs> I ran 100-year-old machines in my factory when I came out of engineering school, 100 years old. And they were running fine, by the way. So a new machine being built today would have more sensors, would have more robotics and fewer gears and levers and cast parts. We would also have 3D, 3D printing. So if I can make parts in my factory, if I can make things with 3D additive manufacturing too, I might be able to change the way I built stuff going forward. So investments being made in 2020 will look very different from an investment I made make in 1980. So bear that in mind. The beauty of our robotic IoT sensor, edge computing, machine learning, and all the other buzzwords that we rarely talk about means I can build a very different factory today, no matter what I make, than the factory I might have built when we built all of these that are inflexible and causing us trouble. Hey, Wayne, you know what? Uh, one of your peers, uh, one of the other uh, digital all-stars here, Tony Uphoff, whose uh, company, you know, covers and uh, is a data platform for the industrial and uh, manufacturing markets. He said that he's found that over the past couple of months during this crisis, he said the level of innovation and just almost like in some ways a combination of re-engineering and innovation that's come up among all different types of industrial companies he said it's been extraordinary and part of it was he said they've been pushing themselves to do stuff they didn't think before was possible and the other side of it he says comes from the demand end he said they've never had these opportunities come up very short cycle lots of these sorts of things are needed can we adapt to do this in a little different way. Can we, in partnership with people we never would have considered as partners before, collaboratively come up with things? And he thinks that there's gonna be some quite powerful, enduring new opportunities and new lessons that come out of this. And I think that's being echoed in some of the things that you're saying here about different ways to think, different ways to see time horizons, and ultimately, what are the opportunities available to a company that in the past might have said, nah, that's, that's out of, my, that's out of my, uh, my space here, not, not for me? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, as I said, I trained as an engineer before I did IT. And there's a saying about engineers. An engineer is somebody that will spend an infinite amount of work to not have to work. We will spend time designing mechanical processes, you know, the Rube Goldberg machine, so that we don't have to actually pick up the hammer or the screwdriver and do the work. And so we've now unleashed the engineers, the same people who did the World War II fighter planes and bombers and victory ships are now turning into ventilators and toilet paper. So I agree with that completely. But there's something else, and I was, one of the things I want to talk about is telemedicine and how it's evolved and, and what you say leads into that. A lot of times the barrier for doing something is not that we can't do it technically, it's that we're not allowed. There's a, a notion called regulatory capture. If I am a doctor in Texas, I can't treat a patient in Oklahoma. I have to be licensed in Oklahoma. I have another license for Nevada. I have another license for uh, Louisiana. Why? Why? By the way, the same thing, why can I not, was it braid? You can't do braids without a cosmetology license in some states, even though all they do is braiding, they never dye your hair, cut your hair, or use a razor on you, which by the way, in Texas, you can't be a beautician and give a shave, you have to be a barber. I learned this as I've changed salons over the years. The, the specialities involved in this are so severe. And the question is, is it necessary? Or is it just there as a barrier to entry? The doctors in Texas don't want those upstarts from Louisiana taking their business. Ditto bartenders and beauticians and whatever. You know, by the way, you can't buy liquor except in very rare cases without going through a liquor distributor. 
car companies can't own car dealerships. Why? Because the powerful car company is going to take advantage of the poor dealer. Now, now look at the, or the consumer, look at the car dealerships now, there are 500 dealerships in one company. Tell me they need that. So we have this notion of regulatory capture that has infused most of our society. You can't do it because it's against the rule. Why can't you sell Texas insurance in New Jersey? And what happened in telemedicine particularly is we've broken down those barriers. Doctors anywhere in the United States can treat patients anywhere else in the United States temporarily. I hope and expect and think that is a permanent change, which will then add fluidity and let labor go where the problem is. And by the way, I don't think that's yet accepted that a doctor in Mumbai with the right training and credential can necessarily treat a person in Louisiana, but why not? As long as we hold them to a minimum credentialing standard, why not? So I think what you're seeing in telemedicine is the advances. And I'd say it's maybe 10 years and 10 weeks, part of its regulatory capture. Uh, the other part, especially in areas where there's either a government or where there's a third party payment infrastructure, healthcare, what is the government allowing to be reimbursed? So telemedicine was not reimbursed very well, if at all not by the VA, and the biggest payer is the CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which affects VA and other government, Medicare, Medicaid, and so on. When they make a ruling, the private companies tend to follow. Just like, by the way, in mortgages, when Fannie and Freddie decide to do something, the private mortgage companies go along. You've got this government behemoth that is controlling by their decision how other people see the world. So the fact that telemedicine can now be reimbursed uh, by the various government entities means the private insurance companies started doing it. And you know, I'm not an expert in the nuances of telemedicine billing, although I was an investor and partner in a telemedicine company. The technology was never the burden. It was fighting the legal battle and fighting the reimbursement battle. Um, that was always the problem. And those battles have been fought and won. So the wave you're seeing of telemedicine adoption was never the tech had to be developed. It was the mindset, the regulatory, and the perceptions that had to be changed. And so you'll see that in other industries. When, when the president invokes the Defense Production Act, what he's saying is, I'm going to make you do something that in some cases we've heard they might have been wanting to do already. So getting the red tape out of the way, when we're doing virus test, uh, vaccine testing, what are we doing? We used to go through stage one. Then, by the way, mm -hmm. fill out documents and I read this, and I don't know if it's true, that in order to submit things to the FDA, they had to be burned into a CD-ROM and mailed. <laughs> this is like, by the way, when doctors want to be reimbursed by the payers, the healthcare companies, do you know how you submit your payment? Fax machine. Fax machine. Why? Because they want it to be as inconvenient and time-consuming and complicated as possible so you don't do it. So we've built this either innocent, dumb bureaucracy or evil bureaucracy to keep people from getting their jobs done. We got to get the friction out of the system. And a pandemic is a great place to say, where is their friction? Let's fix it. And so in telemedicine, we've seen a ton of it. Now, I, I want to just say the next advance in telemedicine is starting to come. And if you think what you've seen is big, wait till the next way. Right now, telemedicine is largely, I sit in front of a screen, the doctor talks to me. Next step is when I'm wearing my smartwatch, my smart ring, my arm sensor, my implanted insulin device, and all of that telemetry, that edge computing and IoT is now feeding back a sensor suite back to the doctor. And by the way, when the EHR systems, electronic health record systems are interoperating, don't get me started on that because the industry, the people who make these systems have been blocking interoperability for years as a form of regulatory capture. You can't change data with another system. So you'll have to put all your hospitals on my system and you'll have to implement it the same way. So don't get me started. I have a whole soapbox for that. But if the doctor can read data from whatever sensors you've got, whether it's Google or Apple or Microsoft or whoever, 
Now we can diagnose remotely without having to be infected. Take it to the next step. What if we could do certain procedures with a robot? You know, we can deliver drugs with a robot. We can deliver lunch with a robot. What if the robot could come take your blood pressure? We know there's robotic surgery. When I had my hip replaced, I saw the equipment they used. Instead of having to keep taking parts in and out of my open wound, they put a camera and a robot, and the robot told the doctor, these are the parts that'll fit. And my surgery took half the time. So we need to be able to have a doctor at the end of a camera and maybe a semi-trained, not doctor grade, maybe a nurse or a paramedic or somebody there. And then how do we run that procedure remotely? When we start seeing that, that'll change. And now I'm going to take you to the next step. And I'm involved in this as a business because I was in the senior living business. That's another whole problem. But we started trying to look at smarter buildings. If I'm monitoring your gait as you walk along the floor, looking for stroke, looking for people that are not moving properly, if the mirror you look at can diagnose problems, if I'm able to see what you've eaten in the cafeteria, if I understand what meds you may not or may have taken, how do I integrate the life in your smart building? And by the way, we talk about the social, legal, and psychological implications of privacy, but imagine your office is monitoring your temperature as you walk down the hall, is monitoring perhaps the viral particles that you emit as you cough. I don't know if that's possible, but one day it will be. How do we integrate all that data and provide telemedicine to be action at a distance, the teleoperator model. Not just sensors, but actuators. How do we let a doctor operate remotely, whether you're on uh, across the world, on a cruise ship, on a, in Antarctica, or on Mars? We're getting there. The technology's not quite there yet in industrial scale, but it's not far. So you're gonna see, for everything you've seen already, telemedicine and health, is going to change more dramatically than I think any of us can imagine. Yeah, Wayne, that is a uh, remarkable stuff there. I, I uh, you know, these things about telemedicine you're describing, and again, who would not want things to move in that direction, right? I mean, there's, I, I like my doctor, I've seen him a long time, but if I could have my exchanges be, uh, you know, from here, you know, take a half hour at lunchtime or so, and, uh, I'd much rather do that. And, th th but again, when you talk about these things like the telemetry sends a sensor suite to the doctor, I mean, these are real things that are going to start to happen soon. More information flow, getting to the right people at the right time in the right ways and allowing both the expectations of the patient, the expertise of the doctor to be applied more specifically, more directly, and to get a lot of the crap out of the way of right going into the office and the first thing they give you is that <laughs> clipboard with those handwritten forms that you filled out 500 times before but they have to be done um and remind me i think the comic strip pogo uh the uh, great philosopher in there once he said we have met the enemy and it is us uh, mm -hmm. and maybe this will be an opportunity for us to uh quit being our own enemies quite so vigorously all the time well, I think a lot of that comes back to those two things I talked about, regulatory capture. The incumbents want to keep barriers to entry so they keep the prices up. We are the priesthood of whatever. We're the only ones that can do this. Um, you know, there was a thing when you get, I, again, I can speak to Texas. When I go to my eye doctor in Texas, by law, they have to give me my prescription. They didn't have to before, so I'd have to go back to them. They do not have to give me my contact lens prescription. So I have to go back to them. I can't use an online service. Why? Because it's too dangerous. They're protecting me from me. So great. You know, just like I, until they changed reimbursement, when I got my hip replaced, I had to spend the night in the hospital. I was bored to tears. They did the surgery an hour later. I was walking around two and a half hours later. I was walking upstairs and they said, well, you got to spend the night, have dinner, have breakfast. We'll let you out in the morning. They changed the payment reimbursement rules at CMS and you could now do it as outpatient. And the number of hips and knees that are being done outpatient skyrocketed because yeah. it's more convenient, much less expensive. Now, don't force me to do them that way if somebody has comorbidities but allow me to do with that if the doctor and the patient and the healthcare environment are comfortable with that. So allow some flexibility in the system. Oh, speaking of comorbidities, if you look at COVID, what are we discovering? 
people who are dying of COVID are not just dying because they're older. They're dying because they have asthma, or they have hypertension, or they have heart problems, obesity, smoking. When you think about all these comorbidities, at what point are we going to say there are behavioral changes I can make? I can lose 10 pounds. I can change the way I eat. I can change my level of activity. How can we use monitoring to help me do that? So I think a focus on wellness might spike as we realize that if this pandemic or the next one, or even the 1918 influenza, I could be better able to survive and thrive if I could make some changes. You know, most of us are sitting at home and a lot of people are talking about the lockdown 15. Everybody's gaining weight. By the way, if you wanna buy a bicycle today, you can't. I bought a couple of them. They're unavailable because everybody turned to something and we're all out bike riding. So this is good. The, I saw in the UK, they're gonna talk about walking more and biking more. How do you keep people out of the confined space? Now, I wouldn't wanna be a gym investor right now, but on the other hand, maybe these telemedicine sensor suites will help us reduce our comorbidity. I have a friend who's an MD, we're a partner in a business, and his comment was if we could monitor blood pressure 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and also understand your breathing rate, your oxygenation, your level of activity, and so on, we would find insights that none of us can begin to imagine right now. Just having that data would lead us with, with good tools, AI-type tools, of course, to find patterns we hadn't found before. So we're on the edge of a ch step change in wellness, in telemedicine, in diagnosis, partly because we have to be but partly because they're getting out of the way. So when there's that combination of, uh, you know, self-interested human behavior and also some extraordinary technology come together here for, for what you're describing, but that more broadly, I think, is your, your concluding point here about the digital transformation in telemedicine, in how people look at these things and, you know, our expectations about what we should be doing, how do we eat, how do we care for ourselves and so on, the whole wellness issue. Um, but you, I think in some ways, there's a lot of companies that are going to have to get well also, you know, after this and through this. And you've got some ideas for, you know, sort of the big picture things to help guide them forward. Well, we, you know, I talk about digital transformation a lot. Obviously, that's our main topic on these videos. And if we think digital transformation is about technology in search of a, solu of a problem to solve, that's wrong. The digital transformation starts with what business are we in? So uh, the example I gave you of why wouldn't I take a mall that's going defunct anyway is retailers close and turn it into a low rise office space. Uh, again, in senior living, we looked at that as a multi-generational community environment and you still might see some of that. If I could eat, work out, go to the entertainment shop and walk through the mall like you see all the retired people doing anyway, that might be an ideal environment for a living space. Turns out there's not enough plumbing to make apartments, but offices don't need quite as much plumbing. So maybe we can rethink what a mall operator does or what a commercial space developer does. And we need a we mall instead of a we work. Um, another thing, take the rental car business. Look, uh, you know, one of the things I think I said to you before is the airline industry, the whole tourism industry is going to change. So let's look at a couple of implications. Airlines are plummeting. There is, I don't want to get in another tube. We talked about vertical tubes and horizontal tubes. That's probably the last tube I want to get into, especially with those frightening pictures of a full airplane with everybody wearing masks and gloves. So that industry is probably not coming back for a while. And you saw Hertz is about to declare bankruptcy, maybe, maybe not. What if, if somebody said to me, and again, I live in Texas, we will give you a sanitized car delivered to you at your home. You could drive it wherever you're going, drop it off. We'd pick it up and we'll give you another car maybe for your trip back. Maybe you need a van on the way there and a limo on the way back. And wouldn't it be great if they were self-driving to some extent? so that I could focus on my conference calls or whatever. I would think that would be a hell of a lot better opportunity for travel than getting on an airplane. I already like to drive, so I see it that way. 
But if somebody comes up with the robo taxi idea that's being bandied about and repurposes the rental car business as the safe, secure, germ-free individual transportation module business, how could you repurpose an industry that thinks of themselves as going airport and back to airport? Let's rethink that business. So there's lots of opportunities going to come up for this. Let's talk about talk about tourism. You know, there's a famous science fiction and scientist named Arthur C. Clarke. Um, he invented pen and didn't patent the communication satellite, wrote 2001 and many other stories. He had a book predicting the future. And what he said was, if we had perfect communication, we'd need a lot less transportation. If we had perfect transportation, we would need a lot less communication. Take it to the logical extreme. If I could teleport into your living room, we wouldn't be at the end of a video conference. I'd teleport into your living room and we'd have this conversation face to face. On the other hand, if our communication was VR goggles, and when I turned my head, I would see out the window behind you, maybe I wouldn't need to travel as much for the experience of traveling. So I got to ship stuff. But what if we started packaging VR vacations? Somebody hang glided or jumped off a building or went toward Machu Picchu or maybe an elevator in Manhattan. That might be the most risky thing somebody could do. And then we all rode their coattails. I actually think there's a book by Philip K. Dick that became an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie where they implanted memories. Well, maybe we need VR travel for a while so we can vicariously experience environments that we may not be willing to travel to. So the point is there are opportunities emerging because they can be done or because they have to be done. And so my advice to close this, if you're a business leader, if you're a business executive, think about what business you're in. Are you in the mall business? Or are you in the space where people can be business? Are you in the rental car business? Or are you, are you in the personal small volume, uh, multi endpoint transportation business? Um, I, I tell the story that companies that thought they were in the buggy whip business back when cars were introduced went out of business. Companies that said they were in the leather business switched to driving gloves and made driving gloves for the cars. Which one did better as the economy transitioned? So we need to be thinking about that. If you're a CEO, if you're a board member, ask yourself, if my construction client, are we going to pour more concrete, more low-rise concrete, more suburban and exurban concrete? Heck yes. But what's going to happen to marine transportation? Are we going to have fewer container ships? So how does that affect our business? If you're in the manufacturing business, what are you going to pull onshore? What are you going to do with a flexible manufacturing system versus continuing business that you're doing? So the business people need to be thinking, what is the business going to look like when we come out of this, when we do the V or the U or the swoosh, which is what they're saying now. When the swoosh comes, I want to be there at the front of that wave. And then, by the way, when you can do M&A, when your competitors have fallen by the wayside and you can snap them up for pennies on the dollar, or you can brand extend. If I'm, again, in the mall business and I can brand something as safe office space, or I'm in the office space business and I can brand them all, how do I take advantage of that? And the answer is going to be, you've got to have data about what's happening. You've got to have flexibility in your operating model. And how do we do that? We do that by using technology. We, you, we do that by having a flexible ERP, by having cloud-based investments so I can switch them when I need to by having an infrastructure that allows me to use robotics, internet of things, machine learning, remote sensors, edge computing, again, all the buzzwords we rarely bring into the boardroom. I, as a CIO or CDO or a CTO, can bring those tools to a board, to a C-suite that is trying to rethink the business. It's time for the business to reach out to IT. It's time for IT to reach out to the business, meet in the middle and say, what business can we be in 12, 18, 24 months from now? So we come out on top when everybody goes out and starts shopping again. I mean, I love that. And I think it's, uh, it's the key issue now. What business are we in? And it's time, I think, for whatever industry somebody's in for, to get out of that notion of saying, well, no, we don't do this, we don't do that. That was in a world that was quite different from where we're headed. So I think you've given everybody a lot to think about here, Wayne. 
thanks for those uh, great perspectives in a number of areas. Uh, we're going to be getting this uh, episode up sometime soon, the show notes with that. There's lots for people to think about. So Wayne, I think that your new home office environment there, your liquor cabinet behind you, it fits you well. You <laughs> come through with a lot of great ideas. And as always, Wayne, thanks a lot. As always, it's my pleasure. And I welcome interaction from the viewers and readers. Perfect, Wayne. Thanks so much. And to all of you who've been listening to Wayne's ideas for today, uh, today about where we're headed, what's going on, what's the new digital world going to look like. Thanks for being with us here at Cloud Wars Live, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, stay safe. We'll see you soon.